Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reforms Committee's 14th meeting of 2019. Before we move to our first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to either switch off their phones or put them on silent, as they may affect the broadcasting system. And the first item on the agenda is for the committee to decide whether we wish to take agenda item three and consideration of all future evidence on financial scrutiny in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. The second item on the agenda is to continue our work on financial scrutiny and this morning we'll be hearing from three panels of witnesses. We've got our first panel with us now. Good morning to you all. We've got Elaine Lorimer, the Chief Executive um, and uh, Revenue Scotland and Mike Patterson, Head of Tax. We've got Don and we've got Don McGilvery, the Deputy Director of Environmental Quality and Circular Economy for the Scottish Government. Good morning to you all. Um, Ms. Lorma, I believe that you have an opening statement you would like to make. So, if, if like that is that. okay, yeah, that's fine. thank you. I'm very conscious. That, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for asking Revenue Scotland to come and speak to you today. I'm conscious it's the first time we have met with your committee. So, um, as Scotland's tax authority, we are responsible for the management and administration of those taxes which are wholly devolved to Scotland, which includes Scottish landfill tax, which was introduced in 2015. And so far, around half a billion pounds of SLFT, as we call it, has been collected by us to fund Scottish public services. And we work in an innovative partnership with SEPA, which creates the opportunity for our tax expertise and their environmental and industry expertise to be used to maximum operational effect. Now, tax can be used to bring about positive behavioural change as well as, of course, be a source of revenue to fund Scottish public services. And we do see change happening in the landfill industry to be ready for the biogradable municipal waste ban. And we also see positive changes in the way in which waste is treated to reduce the amount going to landfill. We also know from experience that tax can drive negative behaviours or negative consequences. And there will always be individuals or companies who either choose to push the boundaries of the tax as much as possible to minimise their tax liability or indeed in extreme circumstances, choose not to comply. And for SLFT, this can result in more waste going to landfill than the policy intent and less recycling or indeed illegal disposals of waste. And this is where Revenue Scotland as the tax authority comes in to undertake compliance work, to make sure that there is a level playing field for taxpayers and that everyone is paying what is properly due. If the policy is well constructed through legislation, the desired behavioural change should come as a result. Now, we know from speaking to taxpayers and their agents that what they seek is clarity and stability in the tax system. They want to be able to plan their affairs with a reasonable amount of certainty. And in the creation of taxes, Scotland follows a set of principles established by Adam Smith. Certainty, equity, convenience and efficiency. And from Revenue Scotland's perspective, this means that any tax should be clear, it should be readily understood, it should be underpinned by legislation that's robust and coherent, that the amount due is fair and proportionate to the taxpayer's ability to pay, and that the tax should be easy to administer and collect so as to keep the burden of administration low, and that the consequences of not complying are clear and straightforward for the tax authority to apply. Now, in our view, those principles stand up well in the consideration of wider fiscal measures other than tax, such as, for example, levies, to make sure that the policy is robust and can be successfully implemented. Thank you. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank and, you. And I suppose it leads on to um, my, my opening question um, about <coughs> what powers the Scottish uh, Parliament has uh, to introduce environmental charges, and it comes I want to ask a supplementary question about how it differs where the charge is a tax and a levy. So maybe, uh, Ms Lorimer, you would want to elaborate on your, your final point there. Well, the powers that, um, as, and I'll bring in um, Ms McGilvery in due course, the powers that uh, the Scottish Parliament has in relation to taxes which we as Revenue Scotland would collect are those taxes for which they have wholly devolved policy competence. And uh, my understanding is that 
uh, Treasury and um, Scottish Government have agreed a set of criteria that would apply to any future wholly devolved tax that could be uh, devolved to Scotland. And it's those taxes which our authority are responsible for. In relation to levies, um, I suppose the distinction between a tax and a levy can be quite fine. Uh, from our perspective, uh, the taxes that we bring in, the revenues from that go straight to the consolidated fund. And they, they are, so they're an income their revenue income to, to the Scottish Government. A levy might not necessarily come straight into the consolidated fund, and perhaps Don could speak yeah, about levies more generally. Yeah, so um, there are a number, as, as Elaine says, there are a number of taxes that the UK Government and the Scottish Government have agreed should be devolved to Scotland in, in uh, policy and um, um, collection terms, so there are a number of specific taxes that uh, there's agreement are devolved. Uh, you probably know what those are. There are things like Scottish landfill tax. Um, then there is also uh, a power that allows Scottish Government to create new environmental taxes, but that power requires us to seek the agreement of Treasury, of the UK Government, before we establish such new environmental taxes. Um, and then there's, uh, as Elaine alludes to, there are things that aren't taxes but are fiscal measures, levies, charges and so on, uh, and where they are for a devolved purpose, and environment is, is generally devolved, um, then you know, there, there's a good chance that that would be uh, devolved. But as, as Elaine says, there, there, there can often be a kind of complex legal analysis required of whether something is a charge, a levy, or right. a tax. Right. But in general, levies are probably easier to argue if they, they apply to the devolved environmental policy. Yes. Um, I mean, given that we um, just have had a commitment from the government to go a lot further in terms of, say, emissions reductions just in the last week, do you feel that the Scottish Parliament has the powers it needs in this area? Or, or I mean, I, I really, I'm not realise I'm maybe asking people in the civil service for their opinion, and that's not a, a space that you like to be in, but. To deliver on environmental policy objectives, not just at the moment, but potential future ones, which are going to have to be a lot stronger, do you feel that there's maybe some other uh, powers that the Scottish uh, Parliament require to do that? Um, again, that, as you kind of allude to, that's probably a question for, for ministers. I think if you were to ask ministers, would they like the power to create new environmental taxes without requiring permission from the UK government? I suspect they would say yes, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, that's... Uh, <laughs> but there was a, is there anything perhaps um, that you see happening in other countries where they're going you know, faster to, to, to realise their environmental objectives that would be useful for the Scottish Parliament to have um, if, you, if you look at other um, or again, is that something you maybe just don't want to again I'd, I'd be reluctant to comment without kind of you okay. know any kind of public statement from ministers to that yeah. effect okay. OK, we'll move on then. Uh, John, John Scott. Right, thank you very much. Um, can I just talk a little bit about the current uh, status of environmental taxes in Scotland? And, and can Revenue Scotland set out uh, what the key challenges uh, and lessons that have been learned in managing the Scottish landfill tax and how has it evolved over the past five years? And how are you, are you feeding that into the current consultation, the lessons learned, I suppose, on the devolved taxes? Maybe one for Mrs Lauren. I, I definitely think that's one for me. Um, so obviously, uh, Revenue Scotland first started collecting SLFT in 2015. So we have four years of operational experience of collecting the tax. Um, it might be useful for the, I alluded to it in my opening statement, but it might be useful perhaps for the committee to uh, know that the way in which uh, we, ministers decided that we should collect that tax involved us being able to delegate some of our function to SEPA. This was recognising that in Scotland, the collaborative approach that we like to take when we are uh, uh, delivering public policy enabled us to work closely with the environmental regulator, which enabled us, therefore, as soon as we started uh, operating the tax, to do so in consort with SEPA. So when we go out on site to uh, look at landfill, to, to deal with the operators and work with the landfill industry, 
We have the regulator, the environmental regulator, who really understands the industry there with us. Mm -hmm. uh, this meant that uh, we were able to keep our costs as an organisation low. It meant that we weren't building up that level of expertise that was already there in a different, in a different public body. Mm -hmm. And it also means that when we are doing our compliance work, um, we can rely on the technical, scientific, analytical experience that SIPA have within their organisation. Um, what we also found, though, it's fair to say, when we started our work on landfill tax, was that this was a tax that HMRC hadn't uh, prioritised in the same way as you would expect us to do. We only have at the moment two taxes that we're responsible for, SLFT and LBTT, and therefore um, the approach that we took going out in consort with SEPA was a new thing for the industry. It's meant that we've been able to really um, get to understand the industry. It's meant that we have been able to really see what's going on in the industry. And as a result of that, it's meant that we've been able to do a level of compliance work that wasn't perhaps uh, done previously. This has with it environmental benefits because it means that what we're doing is we're making sure what goes to landfill is in line with the legislation and the policy intent. Um, it also um, brings with it, of course, revenue benefits, although that's not our major driver. Our major driver is to make sure that there is a level playing field across the industry in Scotland, because it is, after all, a commercial industry. Um, and so these are the lessons, if you like, that we have, we have taken um, from, from uh, delivering on, on the tax the first four years. Excellent. Thank you very much. And how important has the landfill tax been in reducing waste going to landfill? And how has the tax interacted with other measures, including the landfill taxes in the rest of the United Kingdom? So, of course, because um, Scotland has devolved responsibility for SLFT, we now have, um, in Wales, um, Wales now has its own Welsh Revenue Authority, which has its equivalent to SLFT, to landfill tax. So we now have three tax authorities, if you like, operating in the United Kingdom in the landfill tax space. Um, this means that because there is devolved competence to Scotland and to Wales, there is, of course, the opportunity uh, or consequence, indeed, of devolution uh, for the policies to diverge slightly. Indeed. Um, you could say, though, that is, the, that is what happens as soon as you devolve something. It gives the relevant parliament the opportunity to set the tax in the way that they would wish it to be for their mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. um, what I could say, to, by way of assurance to the committee, though, is that we work very closely with our equivalent tax authorities, be it HMRC for England and the Welsh Revenue Authority for Wales, because, of course, uh, some of the businesses that we are dealing with in landfill, they don't stop at the border. You know, they are indeed uh, UK, sometimes wide businesses. Um, so we work closely with the tax authorities so that we understand where, uh, how our approach, if it is diverging, how it's diverging, but also enables us to share uh, using properly regulated uh, uh, information sharing powers. We can share information in relation to our compliance work. Thank you. Can I briefly bring in Stuart Stevens? Oh, apologies, on you go, Mr. Uh, I, I, I was simply going to... Um, come in on the bit about the effectiveness and, and, and the link with other policy measures. So um, it, it's fairly self-evident, obviously, that landfill has been steadily reducing in Scotland since the introduction of the landfill tax. Um, I think in terms of household waste, for the first time last year, we re recycled more than we landfilled, which was, was a fairly significant uh, milestone. But what I would say is it's, it's not the tax on its own necessarily that has achieved that. So the tax has absolutely been a central measure in achieving that reduction in landfill but it's operated alongside other policy measures such as improving recycling infrastructure, investment in, in, in kind of local authority, kind of curbside collections, those kind of things. So it's, it's an example of where the tax is central to ach achieving a, an objective, but where the overall objective might require other measures in addition to the tax in order to get the full benefit of, of, of what you're trying to achieve. Okay. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I'm looking for quite a short answer, let me just say. Um, the, the subject of data sharing, and you talked about sharing data uh, between the three tax authorities yes. in Ireland, um, but, but also you're talking about clearly data sharing between SEPA and Revenue yes. Scotland. 
Are there any inhibitions in the current rules covering uh, data sharing, in both in relation to uh, corporate data, where I suspect probably not much of a problem, but personal data, particularly under the GDPR rules? Um, I think uh, yeah. my colleague is going to take that question. Um, we've not come across any um, significant barriers um, that I'm aware of to date. Um, if, if there's that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> John. Thank you. Moving swiftly on, so what are the expected implications for tax revenue and on the recipients of the hypothecated revenue, that is to say the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund, of the forthcoming 2021 ban on biodegradable waste going to landfill? Yeah. So... Do you want me to take that? So we know from um, uh, current government forecasts and Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasts that the expectation is that we will see a significant reduction in landfill tax revenues. We currently bring in around £150 million a year in landfill revenues, mm -hmm. and we're expecting that to drop to around £30 million if the forecast is correct. Of course, the forecast is dependent on uh, the industry being ready um, more broadly for... Um, for uh, landfill to be reduced to that effect. And Brexit, what likely effect is Brexit going to have on that? I'm afraid I, I have, have no view on that at all. <laughs> beyond so your peak. Beyond my... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The, the question on uh, the effect of Brexit on, on, on landfill and landfill tax, I mean, the, the answer is, the answer is should, it should be very little. I mean, we have enough landfill capacity in Scotland to deal with the waste we generate in Scotland. So if it was only if, for example, there was a problem that occurred in terms of waste capacity in England and, and waste started flowing into Scotland, that there would be a significant effect. But that's, that's very, hard to, very hard to judge. Oh, fine. That's good. I find that very reassuring. Thank you. Mark, Mark have you got a short um, question? Has there been consideration of taxing other parts of the waste hierarchy? So, for example, incineration? This one for you, don't yeah. you think? So, so there is no active um, work in the Scottish Government at the moment on a on a energy from waste tax or an incineration uh, tax. You know, I have I have heard the words incineration tax mentioned in waste management circles as a, you know, is is, is it something that will come next? Uh, you know, as, as as the next step up the waste hierarchy uh, to try and push things up more into reduction and reuse. Um, so. I have heard uh, people kind of speculate it on the waste, on in the waste management world, but uh, there's there's no active uh, work on an incineration tax in Scottish government at the moment. John, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so, what should the objectives of the forthcoming aggregates levy be, and what involvement has Revenue Scotland had so far in designing it, and are you looking to other countries which have used aggregate levies? Well, of course, the uh, policy uh, for aggregates levy is for the Scottish Exchequer, not for Revenue Scotland. Um, so I'm afraid, you know, in terms of what international comparisons, etc., and what the plans are for the tax, that's a question really for the Scottish Exchequer, not for me. But what I would say is Revenue Scotland it stands ready to work with government in the way that we have done with our other taxes to uh, give our, uh, of our technical experience in terms of how a tax such as that could be administered well. Uh, thank you. So my, so my understanding is that um, the Scottish Government has commissioned a report from environmental consultancy, Unomia, on uh, some uh, options around aggregates levy and, and, and the future of it. Now, that report, as I understand it, has not yet been completed and published, but there is some active work there uh, ongoing from my uh, tax policy colleagues to look at future design options for the aggregates levy. Right, thank you. And so is Revenue Scotland advising the Scottish Government on any options for further environmental taxes that you can tell us about? Uh, <coughs> We're not, we're not, um, what, what, the way in which we operate with Scottish Government is obviously the, the, they, are, they are the leads in relation to policy and therefore once they uh, come up with us a policy proposal, we're very happy to work with them in terms of the, how that could be implemented from a, a tax authority perspective. So we, we offer our technical expertise once that policy uh, becomes clearer. Right, yes. Mr. McGilvey. So, um, 
probably the biggest thing that's happening in terms of fiscal measures at the moment in the environmental world is reform of the uh, packaging producer responsibility system, which is not a tax, but it is a kind of fiscal measure in that it tries to internalise some of the costs of um, dealing with packaging waste at the end of life. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there is a major proposal out at the moment uh, for a reform of that where the Scottish Government is consulting jointly with the UK Government, Welsh Government and Northern Ireland uh, on a major reform of that system to come in over the next few years. So that's, that's probably the biggest thing in the landscape at the moment in terms of a significant proposal for change. And is that to do with plastics or it's or all other types of it's all types of packaging. So it's packaging. it's uh, it's plastic, cardboard, um, wood, metal, anything that's essentially used in in consumer packaging. Right, well, very helpful. And finally, presumably, if an environmental tax is working as it should, revenues should decline over time. So, what does this mean for managing environmental taxes in particular? where revenue is hypothecated to support environmental projects. Is funding going to dry up for these projects? As, uh, my personal view is, yes, unless, unless there is an alternative mechanism put in place, the way the, S, the, way, the, way the Landfill Communities Fund works at the moment, as you've identified, yeah. is that it is a percentage of the, the tax that goes to that fund. So if the tax uh, revenues fall, uh, unless there is a replacement put in place for it, the revenues associated with that fund will fall too. Right. That's, that's great. That's fine. Thank you very much. <coughs> Finlay Carson. Good morning. I'm going to move on to the, the carrier bag uh, charging. Uh, what information and evidence is available on the impact of the 5p uh, bag charge and, and, and what effect it's had in Scotland and how are those impacts recorded? So the, the, the carrier bag charge was introduced in October 14. Uh, the main piece of information we have is from a year-on study that was published in October 2015. Uh, it suggested that uh, something of the order of £6.7 million pounds was being raised from the charge at that point and that the charge had achieved something like an 80% reduction in the use of single-use carrier bags at that point. Uh, we have not, since that point, done a central collection of data for the charge, so, so that October 15 study is still the most recent uh, information we have on the impact of the charge. Can I ask, has policy divergence within the, the UK caused any uh, issues? And if so, how, how did you manage those? Um, th there, there are not any significant issues with divergence that I'm aware of uh, in terms of the way carrier bags work. Uh, then, you know, the nature of it is that people tend to kind of shop in their local shop, if I can put it that way. Um, and, you know, there aren't, there aren't huge kind of cross-border effects of the carrier bag charge that I'm aware of. Of course, England Wales then uh, brought in to effect their own carrier uh, bag charge um, and they've recently kind of brought forward proposals to then uh, adjust the design of their carrier bag charge to be much more like the Scottish uh, design. So actually, to the extent that there were any uh, border effects, those, those, those are reducing and will reduce further. Okay, so what, what's the rationale behind increase, a potential increase in the charge from 5p to 10p? And, and does that, has that been partly driven by a preference to have a, a UK-wide approach? Uh, that's very much a, a Scottish proposition. Um, obviously, the, 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 the UK government uh, brought forward uh, its proposals. Um, but to be honest, the, probably the bigger driver is much more about just the normalisation of consumer behaviour around the carrier by charge. There's certainly some anecdotal evidence that people have kind of... Um, you know, the, the initial effect of the introduction of the charge, you know, that, that kind of... Um, uh, the effect it had on consumers in that initial phase has sort of gradually normalised and, and, and faded out at least a little bit. Uh, and we think that increasing the charge to 10p will then um, give that a, a, another little step in terms of consumer minds and, uh, you know, give them a further jolt, if you like, to, um, you know, consider ways to change their behaviour to avoid the charge. Okay, so do you see an end point 
Should the government actually have ambitions to phase out single-use uh, plastic bags altogether? And, and you know, you said it's going to tail off. Um, should a ban be on the table? Um, most of the big retailers have, have, have um, made significant moves on this on a, on a voluntary basis. So, you, you know, a lot of them have moved away from providing single-use bags that they, they only sell kind of bag for life now. Mm -hmm. So. The, the the market by itself has uh, adjusted a fair bit in this space uh, in terms of the activity of of, of the big retailers. Um, you know, I think we'd maybe need some more information then about where we currently stand, how things have changed since October 15, before we considered any kind of further measures of the of the of the nature you're describing, Mr. Carson. Okay, thanks. It, you know, earlier on we talked about the difference between taxis and levies. So, if, and with the, the plastic bags in mind. What have the implications of the charge been a levy rather than a tax? Um, and for example, how effective has the, the voluntary arrangements between retailers and uh, revenues for good cause been? Um, so the, the, the real difference here between a, a, a levy and a tax is that in a levy, essentially there's no, there's no revenue raising function here for, for government. There's no central collection of any revenue. It's for the retailers themselves to decide how to use the, the money that's raised and how to distribute it. Um, a number of them voluntary, voluntarily report through a Zero Waste Scotland portal on money that they're donating and, and uh, some information about how they're using it. Um, you know, there is an enforcement function in the regulations, but it's, it's never, to my knowledge, been used. Um, our understanding is that compliance with the uh, objectives and the, the rules of the charge are, uh, it, it is very good. Um, you know, I'm not aware of there being any level of, of complaints about compliance uh, as it currently stands. Okay, thank you. And finally, what lessons can be drawn from the carrier bag levy so far as it being applied in the future for other environmental charges? Um, so, you know, I think, I think one of the lessons that a lot of people have taken from the carrier bag charge experience is that actually quite a small change can have quite a, a, a big impact, that actually people will, um, you know, it, it can be an effective way of changing consumer behaviour, even at a, a relatively low level. Um, you know, there are issues in there about how easy is it to change from the thing you want to get away from to an alternative. And in the carrier bag space, um, I think one of the things that's obvious there is that there was a ready alternative available, which is the, ca the, the bag for life or the, you know, the canvas bag or, or, or alternatives uh, available. So you know, those are the sort of lessons I would, I would draw from the experience to date. Thank you. Mark Ruskell. Can I ask about the expert panel on environmental charges? Um, what its main purpose is? Who sits on it? Uh, when will it be uh, expected to report? Um, so its its purpose is essentially to advise government on um, the use of charges and other measures for addressing our throwaway culture. So its its focus is very much on on single use items, uh, its main focus to date has been on single-use plastics and on coffee cups. Um, the area where it's f uh, furthest down the road is in the disposable coffee cups, disposable beverage cups, uh, whichever term you want to use, uh, area where um, it is, you know, uh, pretty close, we think, to providing an initial set of advice to government. Uh, it's also started looking at other specific things like plastic straws, um, but it's probably got a little bit more work to do in that area before it reports to government. But um, my understanding is that they are, they are pretty close to reporting to government on coffee cups. So for example, they've been out last week testing some initial uh, propositions with industry, NGOs, other stakeholders. Um, and you know, they're, they're, uh, my understanding is that the next step is that they'll kind of assimilate some of the feedback from those sessions before uh, trying to finalise some uh, report to government on, on the disposable coffee cups issue. Yeah. And in terms of those single-use um, coffee cups, I mean, uh, has the group been looking at perhaps differentiation in the way that a levy is applied? So, uh, compostable coffee cups, for example, should they be charged at a similar level as?
non-compostable coffee cups. Um, what they've been doing is looking at a range of evidence out there from various studies that have been done on um, both charging and discounting for coffee cups and, and different designs of trials and studies and pilots that have been done in different parts of the country and, and internationally, and they, they've looked across that evidence and tried to draw some conclusions about the, the effectiveness of different designs of, of, of charges. Um, whether they will end up recommending any differentiation in terms of material types, um, I, I think their focus has been very much on the, the traditional design of, of disposable coffee cups and how best to address you know, some of the sustainability, sustainability issues that exist with those as it stands. Yeah. And as part of that investigation, has been looking at capacity and infrastructure, say, for composting or, or treating conventional uh, disposable coffee cups? Has that been a...? They, they've looked very hard at the, the current evidence around what is the infrastructure that exists for recycling of the existing kind of uh, model of disposable beverage cup. They've also looked at how various trials have influenced the level of recycling, how different uh, incentives and, and um, infrastructure changes have impacted on the recycling rate for, for that particular waste stream. So they, they, they've looked at all that kind of evidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what about the potential for different levies or approaches uh, across the UK? I mean, you know, we've seen uh, initial interest at UK level. Now there's more of a focus on getting more recycled material into disposable cups. So. Is, it, is this a kind of a, a Scottish focus, or is there a, a look at uh, wider so intra-UK approaches? Or I suppose you've kind of been here before with deposit return schemes as well. Yeah. Obviously, you've come to a conclusion on that. Um, so but I'm just interested to know where you're at with this. So the panel is looking at a, specifically in the Scottish context, although it has looked at evidence from yeah. across the UK and internationally. Um, that said, uh, it has acknowledged that there are big UK initiatives coming in this space. So I mentioned producer responsibility for packaging, the reform of that. That, that will impact on coffee cups uh, fairly significantly. Um, so the, 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 they have looked at a range of measures across the waste hierarchy, across the product cycle, if you like. So it's, it's not just a charge. Uh, it's not just charging that they've been looking at. They've been looking at producer responsibility and other measures to encourage recycling and, and so on as well. So, um, but the, the main focus of their work is in a Scottish context um, on coffee cups. Um, I don't think to date we've, uh, the panel has at the moment um, found a, a major issue with cross-border effects uh, on that. Um, but again, we're, we're still awaiting their final advice. Yeah. yeah. And, and is there a need for certainty around the wider producer responsibility scheme first before moving on DRS, for example, or, or, or levy on, on coffee cups? I mean, I'm just thinking, is there a potential for unintended consequences if you don't have that wider framework of producer responsibility? Um, I think uh, there is definitely a value in making sure the different components are designed in a way that they complement each other and work together. Um, certainly in the work that we've done as officials, we believe that's eminently possible um, and uh, should happen to, you know, in, in, uh, fairly naturally if, if you get the design of the schemes right and that they're, they're incentivising different things in slightly different parts of, of the market. Um, I, I, you know, the, the view that ministers have taken is that, you know, they, they don't think there is a need to wait on producer responsibility before uh, finalising the design of the DRS or moving ahead on things like coffee cups. Uh, the things, they do need careful design to complement each other, but the view that ministers have taken is that that doesn't stop you from acting swiftly on the things we can act on in Scotland. Mm -hmm. and, and will the expert panel continue in the future? And if so, what, what is in its future work programme? Yeah, so Coffee Cups is just the, just the first, uh, it was set up with a two year lifespan, so it, it started in June last year, so it's, it's sort of, you know, uh, nearly a year into its work. Uh, as I say, it's, it's, its first major report will be on, on Coffee Cups is our expectation, but they do have other things that they've started working on, um, on straws, and they've also had papers on things like disposable cutlery and plates and things like that. Um, you know, so that they'll start moving on to other things, I think, um, over the course of the coming months. Uh, so that they, they still have another year to do further reports on other items. 
Bring in Finn Carson. Uh, it, you've touched on it somewhat with, with regards to the uh, uh, producer responsibility schemes. Do those? Do you believe that those need to be underpinned with? Uh, or enforced, if you like, by levies and tax, or can they be driven by consumer choice? So, the, if I talk about the producer responsibility scheme for, for packaging, which is the big one, um, really the purpose of that producer responsibility scheme is to try and internalise in what producers pay the cost of dealing with the waste at end of life, which wouldn't naturally be built into the price of the packaging or the, or the item that goes into it. So it does, um, it is based on a system of producer fees. So the producers, retailers and so on in the chain have to pay a fee for putting that material on the market. Uh, the, the current system is a very complicated system. It's based on a system of producer responsibility notes, which producers have to buy a certain number of based on the amount of material they put on the market. What the current consultation is looking at is, is shifting that significantly onto the possibility of a, a range of different models that you might choose to, to reform that. But the, by far the biggest thing in there is that the current producer responsibility scheme for packaging is only recovering about 10 or 15 per cent of the cost of dealing with that material at the end of life. Uh, what the EU circular economy package requires is that we move that much more towards something like t towards 100 per cent of the cost. So the new scheme will raise significantly, significantly more money in terms of producer fees when it's introduced in around 2023. Are those consumer fees within uh, are set by the producers, or is that likely to be an environmental levy or an environmental tax? So at the moment, it's set by the market in terms of the cost of these producer responsibility notes and the export notes, which are a, a kind of equivalent form of them. So it's, there's a kind of a market mechanism at the moment, um, which is incredibly complex to try and explain. Um, the the Proposals for the future include a, a number of models that the, the UK government and, and, and the other governments have set out um, for different models that the future system could take from an expansion of the current system to something that's based much more on a kind of producer fee. But again, would that, is, is that a levy or a tax? Again, that would need a, a bit of further analysis, I think, uh, before I could be absolutely sure um, in, in saying whether that's going to end up looking like a levy or a tax in the future. In fact, that subject of about uh, single-use plastic packaging, um, particularly, um, I think it's pretty obvious the difference between the UK supermarkets and maybe if you go into the continent, like Spanish or French supermarkets, we don't, we have a, a lot of our fruit and veg wrapped, whereas if you go to a supermarket in Spain, you will, you know, it will be loose. Is there anything happening in other countries in, in, in Europe where is, is that because is that a cultural thing or is that because they have more strict kind of uh, levies and taxes around that and there's any lessons that we could be learning from, from those you know large supermarkets that don't have the same level of plastic packaging as they do in uh, Scottish, English, Welsh and Northern Irish stores? Um, so um I'm not aware of it being a tax issue in other countries that's driving this. I, I suspect it's much more of a cultural issue. Um, the packaging producer responsibility reform will start to bear on this issue in that, um, you know, essentially those people that, that use plastic and other packaging will be paying a lot more mm. through the producer responsibility scheme for that packaging, particularly if it is difficult to recycle. Uh, and the aim of then the producer responsibility reform is to drive um, producers and retailers towards the absolute minimum use of packaging and to use packaging which is more recyclable. So that is the absolute aim of the reform of the scheme. Okay. Um, move on to questions from uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and uh, good morning to you all. Um, I want to explore uh, a bit further the priority areas for new environmental charges and interaction with other policy tools, so whichever the panel feel it's appropriate to answer. Uh, as we've heard um, very helpfully, the expert panel's focus has been on single-use plastics. Uh, could, could you, it, it possibly be you, Don, 
uh, explore the, um, the other what I would call big ticket areas that should be prioritised. There's been a lot about, pla uh, about um, textiles recently, and you'll know, but just for the record, the Environmental Audit Committee has, has looked at the sustainability of fast fashion, for instance, and there's also been issues around the sustainability of horticultural peat and its extraction. So I wonder if you could highlight any areas that you think or you, you know are being looked at and how we can be as innovative as possible. Um, so there was, there was work done some time ago on a kind of hit list of what are the problem issues in the waste stream. Um, and it was done with Zero Waste Scotland and SEPA and others. Um, and aside from the kind of single use kind of throwaway things, the, the big ticket items are tyres, mattresses, um, there is an issue about carpets and text textiles, um, furniture, I think, is, is on the list as well. Um, so so the, the, there is a kind of hit list of, of other things uh, which are known problems in the waste stream, if I can put it that way. Um, one of the things to be aware of there is then that the UK government in its waste and resources strategy did speculate on whether or did uh, start to look at whether further producer responsibility schemes should be brought in for things like tyres and mattresses and some of these other problem um, issues. Um, you know, I, th I think that is a, a definite, um, you know, area that we are interested in in discussing with the UK government, um, you know, the, the three existing producer responsibility schemes, which are for packaging, for waste electronic and electrical equipment, and for end-of-life vehicles, are regarded as, as, as reasonably uh, effective. So the question is, are there some of these other areas that we should be expanding producer responsibility measures into? Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. And how, um, is there a view on how the Scottish Government um, should prioritise um, areas for new environmental charges in terms of process and what weight should be given to different factors such as um, should they be principally based on the potential for positive environmental outcomes or existing levels of damage or do um, other factors need to be balanced against this, um, uh, the cost of administration and revenue potential and public and industrial um, acceptability. So any comments from any of you on that? So Elaine will probably help me a little bit here, I hope. Um, but essentially, in, in terms of taxes, you know, they can have two purposes. One is to change behaviour and one is to raise revenue. And um, some, some taxes are a combination of the two. On environmental taxes, they tend to have to be slightly more biased towards the behaviour change than the revenue raising. Mm. Um, but beyond that, then, for the design, the principles for the design of environmental taxes, I think, are, are, are much the same as, as for most other um, policy measures that are about kind of fairness, proportionality, trying to avoid regressive effects, those kind of things. Yes. Elaine, hopefully you can help yes, me a little bit. Yes, that's right, and it's, it's the Adam Smith principles that I refer to right at the very beginning, as well as, I think, um, from a, the administrative perspective, we want to be introducing things which are... Come, the cost of administration is kept low. So um, our tax authority, for example, um, we started from the basis of being digital by default. So mm -hmm. you know, the impact on the taxpayer in terms of re making the return, it's all done online. And the, the fact that we've got the um, relationship that we have with um, SEPA means that our administrative costs are well below the sort of comparable uh, tax administrations. So these are the sorts of factors I think that would need to be taken into account in designing any scheme. The other thing I would say though is it's important not to underestimate um, the importance of clarity because uh, if something like a new tax or a new levy is being introduced we want to make sure that everyone understands their obligations so that the policy intent is delivered at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So there's a danger sometimes of tax legislation has a has a has a, uh, a history of being complex. Um, mm -hmm. So if we have the opportunity in Scotland to design things um, from scratch, our starting point would be let's try and make this as straightforward as possible. And, and could I ask you if there's any analysis, and if so, what sort of analysis there is of any regressive um, aspects of taxes, that, of these taxes? 
what effect they would have on different, asp different um, parts of the population and people on low income and, and that sort of issue? Um, in if landfill, that's an appropriate it, definition. Yes, it's, it's difficult me, for me to answer. I mean, certainly we know that in Scotland, the way LBTT, the Lands and Buildings Transaction Tax, yeah. is designed is designed in a way that it is not regressive in that way. Mm -hmm. um, landfill tax is an entirely different type yes, of tax. Yes, so yes. I'm afraid I'm unable to comment beyond those. Did, did you have a comment on that, Mike? Mm -hmm. No, not beyond that, no, right. because land, the landfill tax is paid by a landfill operator. So yeah. in, how that feeds through to the ultimate consumer is, is some way further down the chain. So the, the impact of the tax is potentially more difficult to measure, but, but that's what it brings into I mean, the measures. Is I mean, there an analysis from thing? your perspective? Yeah, I mean, how, how, how most people pay for their waste management uh, as a household is through their council tax, which yes. Ha yeah, so it has its own mm -hmm. kind of... Um, well, I'm sure you have your own views on the progressiveness of council tax, but uh, that, that's, uh, that's the way that most people pay for their waste management. Yeah. And, and just lastly, from my perspective, for any of you to answer as appropriate, um, there, there are other tools in the box other than taxes and levies uh, in terms of envir our environmental goals, of course. Um, what, are there key considerations? Well, there are, of course, but sorry, that's not very well put. But um, whether tax or levy is the right approach uh, in, in contrast with other tools such as regulation and what um, my colleague um, Finn Carson's already raised about a voluntary approach. Is there any comment on any of that? You want to answer that, Mike? I, I think the, the answer my, my um, Chief Executive uh, Elaine Lorimer gave earlier on in terms of um, Revenue Scotland working hand in hand with the regulator, I think that provides a unique approach, indeed one that's now been copied across the UK. I think the ability to do both or, or see both sides of the end to end analysis of, of what's happening in a landfill site. It's about horses for courses as well. Um, it's it's what's going to be the most effective measure, you know. So, um, you know, you, you know the issue about kind of cotton buds, you know, where you know we've just taken the decision there that actually what you need to do is is ban the plastic stem cotton buds um, because you know a charge or a tax in that area probably isn't going to con change consumer behaviour in, 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 in to the same degree, you know. So it's 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 all about an analysis of of what's going to be most effective and most proportionate in changing consumer behaviour, often it's, it's, it's that judgement that needs to be made. And, and, and in a number of these areas, um, you know, uh, I referred to landfill earlier, you know, the, the tax might be only one of a range of measures yeah. that you might take to try and address the bigger issue, which is about waste minimisation and recycling. Okay. I guess you expect me to say um, at the end of the day we also need to raise revenue in Scotland to fund our public services and so on. another trade-off is you know, how do we raise the, the revenues that we require to be able to deliver the policies that the government wants to deliver. Angus MacDonald. Yeah, thanks. Um, convener, um, if I could just go back to uh, Claudia Beamish's uh, first point which raised the, uh, a question regarding horticultural peat. Um, we know that RSPB Scotland and the SWT have suggested a levy on horticultural peat uh, as part of possible measures to address the issue of unsustainable peat extraction. Now, I asked the Cabinet Secretary about this some time ago and she said she didn't think uh, we had the power to, to, to deal with that. Um, has that been looked at recently and is there any intention to introduce it? Um, so I am not aware of work on uh, a levy for a, a horticultural peat. What I am aware of is, though, in kind of significant regulatory measures around uh, extraction of peat for horticultural purposes. Now, the detail of that I haven't got to hand uh, with me today. Uh, but my understanding is that essentially you need a licence for large-scale peat extraction um, and uh, that a much stricter view is being taken of renewing those licences uh, where the, the purpose of extracting the peat is for horticultural uh, products. Okay. Thank you. Finn Carson. Uh, as, as you're aware, that, that we're, we're currently looking at a climate change bill um, and the committee was quite concerned that the the, the lack of information when it came to the finances uh, around about the bill. And, and last week, we've, the First Minister declared a climate change emergency, which would suggest we need to put uh, new actions into place a lot more quick, quickly than we thought otherwise. Would that suggest that 
tax raising is more likely, there's likely to be a more emphasis on tax raising to generate the, the income that you've mentioned to address some of these uh, climate change issues, but also to accelerate uh, consumer behaviour. Something I'm able to comment on um, uh, because that would definitely be a matter for my colleagues in the Scottish Exchequer who look after tax policy. Now, I think that is probably a question for ministers as it currently stands. Uh, you know, with a, a bill active in Parliament, uh, I think I think that's probably at the current time a, a question that's that's much better directed to ministers. I think. But, well, here's a hypothetical question from a tax raising point of view, and you spoke, uh, Ms. Lorimer, about raising revenue being important, and presumably important in a sustainable way. So as these taxes that are introduced um, deliver behaviour change, and therefore the taxes themselves reduce over the long term, in terms of having the money that you, the monies that you had previously enjoyed constantly reducing, does that of itself mean that you will need to continue thereafter to keep on introducing new taxes to keep uh, to, you to in the standard to which you become accustomed? <clears throat> uh, well, I'm afraid the choice as to whether new taxes are introduced or not is, is not mine. Uh, I'm simply the, 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 the administrator who, who delivers uh, 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 the collection of an administration of taxes once Parliament has passed the requisite legislation. Um, but, but clearly Scotland requires a certain level of revenues to be able to fund policy. And that's a choice of, for ministers and for parliament as to how they raise these revenues. But we stand ready, certainly, to collect any taxes which are, we are asked to do. Thank you. And I have a, before um, we close this session, um, something that was mentioned really early on in the session, which uh, rung a bell with the, myself and my colleague talking about um, non-biodegradable waste or non-recyclable waste and a... Uh, no deal Brexit situation. We heard from colleagues in the, in the waste uh, sector that we could have a situation where that waste, which is normally exported onto um, the continent, could be building up at ports. In a situation like that, where you mentioned that there was quite a lot of landfill capacity in Scotland to deal with that kind of waste, what would happen in a situation where maybe the rest of the country didn't have that capacity? And want to, you know, in terms of tax, how would that work? Who would be, how would that tax be collected if there was, I suppose, a, a flow of that waste into Scotland and, and dealt with? And how would that affect our, I guess, our targets in terms of, of, of uh... I, I, I'll let you go, John. And then I'll so, so the, there's two things I want to say here. So, um, the, one of the key points is that we, we don't want to. Uh, landfill recyclable waste if we can at all help it so mm -hmm. um, you know for for some of the waste that's exported it's it's recyclable uh, waste and it's only as an absolute last resort that you would end up um, you know it, it would only if, if they were in a real crisis situation that you'd end up even thinking about uh, landfill for that uh, material so uh, but then in terms of the technicalities of the tax um, well, who is responsible for the payment of tax and therefore right. the land it would it, it would uh, if the if the waste was disposed of at a landfill site in Scotland, it would be the landfill operator for that landfill site that would pay the tax, okay. which would therefore mean it would be coming to the Scottish Consolidated Fund. Right. So it doesn't matter where that waste comes from. It's, it's where it's disposed of. Uh, okay. And again, in terms of um, the waste targets, I think it's where the waste is generated that our stats are based on rather than where it's disposed of. But I, would, I think I'd need to double check that. Right, OK, well, thank you for that. Um, I don't think there's any more questions from my colleagues. Thank you very much for your time this morning. We'll suspend this meeting briefly to allow the change in panel. <laughs>
Uh, welcome back. Uh, we now move on to our second panel of witnesses this morning, and I am delighted to welcome Michael Cairns, Economic Advisor to the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor, and Uzma Khan, Deputy Director of Economic Strategy in uh, the, G the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor for the Scottish Government. Good morning to you both, and thank you for coming in. So it, it is early days, and I realise that what we're about to ask you is, is about you know, something that has only just begun um, in terms of the, the well-being economy uh, governments. Can you, um, for, for starters, set out um, how the wellbeing economy governments came about, who's involved, and what the Scottish Government's objectives in engaging and with it and coordinating it are to get us going. Yeah, certainly. Can. So I'll kick off by just saying something about its inception, how it came to be, how we got here, and uh, Michael can maybe pick up in terms of who we've been engaging with, and we can talk about next steps. We're still really fresh from our meeting um, just last week, so our first policy lab, which is a part of a core part of the wellbeing group of governments, kind of function. Um, we had that just last week on Wednesday and Thursday, so we're still trying to reflect on the discussions of the day. Um, so, so bear with us as we kind of catch up and talk about the same time. But in terms of the inception, so you'll know that we launched our economic strategy in 2015, which set out our approach to economic growth in Scotland. And within that, there was a new concept of around inclusive growth and that firm emphasis that our growth had to be a different kind of approach. It had to be more about inclusion, it had to be about sustainability, and it had to be about economic growth that benefits all places and, and people. Um, since that time, we've kind of, since it was published over the last two years, we've been working around what does actually inclusive growth mean in practice? How do we design policies that actually work? How do we recognise the trade-offs for able to meet these multiple, but sometimes conflicting objectives as well? So our office has been doing a lot of work over the last two years, understanding what does inclusive growth me me mean in practice for practitioners and policymakers and evidence and measurement and data and so forth. Um, last year, we published the National Performance Framework, which went a bit further it said our vision for what Scotland's performance as a whole should look like and it brought to its heart the issue around well-being and we believe inclusive growth and well-being are very much aligned in terms of its principles one looks at the specific attributes of growth whereas the well-being agenda looks a lot more broadly at a much wider range of factors and we began to talk about the economy in terms of well-being as well um, so since that time, we had an inclusive growth conference in 2017, and at the start of the conference, um, the First Minister held a breakfast session with um, international delegates who were quite interested in understanding what does a well-being economy mean for our governments? How do we act in that? What does that mean for measurement? How do we describe its success? And how do we create policy thinking around it? So that's how the well-being group of governments came into effect. Since then, we've been talking to a range of countries who are interested in getting beneath the skin of these terminologies and these concepts and really understanding how do we collaborate? How do we get officials together at that very working policy working level in terms of understanding what works in other countries, what doesn't? Do we face similar challenges? And our objective's always been that we find similar small kind of advanced economies, or, or maybe not other economies who are interested, but who have are grappling with similar big issues of the day um, economic growth, climate change, social inclusion, how do we get together and really understand what does that mean for how we measure success in the economy? And that, that's where it's kind of come from, essentially. Um, we've been developing this since kind of 2017. We have had a number of meetings, which Michael can kind of go through in a wee bit more detail. Um, just last week, we had our first policy lab, which is a, uh, which is a core part of the well-being group of governments. The policy lab is really just about identifying common areas of interest between governments and getting officials together um, to try and bring together policy experts and work through what are, what are the common challenges and how do we kind of go forward in tackling them and what are the big issues? How do, for example, New Zealand um, do a wellbeing budgeting? How does Iceland and Scotland and New Zealand think about natural capital and its challenges around sustainable tourism? And these were all topic areas that were suggested by the countries and when we find common ground, we decide that actually it'd be suitable for a policy lab. Um, so last week, our policy lab concentrated in three areas that um, all three countries who, who attended were really keen to explore further. And they were around performance frameworks and wellbeing agenda, including learning a wee bit more about um, New Zealand's wellbeing budgeting, um, child poverty, and also um, natural capital and sustainable tourism. And it was a one and a half day session, so we didn't 
we, we touched on common issues, explored issues around measurements and policies and challenges, but um, there's a consensus that this group will move forward and look at some of these issues in a bit more depth. Thank you very much. It strikes me, listening to you, that um, the narrative around uh, performance is going to be a, a tricky thing. It seems a long-term vision, um, which in well-being is something that is more difficult to quantify and, and measure. Yeah. So there may be alongside your work has to be a shift in narrative about how things are reported, for example, even in the media. Um, around, around politics. Um, we'll move on to uh, my colleagues now. Uh, Finn Carson has questions for you. Good morning. Um, can I ask, what work is it the Scottish Government undertaking to embed well-being in economic policy? Okay, so our well-being is really defined through the national performance framework at that high level. Um, what we're doing across government is really trying to think about how do our policies align to the outcomes set out in the national performance framework. Alongside that, we're define, trying to define inclusive growth and really understand how do local areas, how do communities, how do regions measure inclusive growth, and then how do we take the learning and measurement and understanding of that and build that up to a much national kind of strategy and thinking around the economy. Okay, you, you mentioned natural uh, capital and sustainable uh, tourism and so on. Um, will your work uh, involve looking at the national parks and how those two organisations are set up a minute already can clearly show that uh, there can be sustainable economic growth uh, coupled with uh, sustainable tourism and natural capital being gained from that. Will that be part of your work to, to put wellbeing whatever actually into practice? It may well evolve into that. So the first policy lab we had touched on high level issues. So just really recognizing some of the big common challenges around natural capital, sustainable tourism. We talked about the type of visitors that each country is experiencing, how they're maybe creating externalities, negative externalities. How do we combine that with the need to want to grow certain sectors, especially around tourism, but balance that with the wider wellbeing and inclusive growth agenda. We didn't touch upon that during the policy labs, but we, we expect that this might be something that naturally evolves out of those discussions with policy experts. I should say that while Michael and I are representing, we form the secretariat for this group, but we, we're, we're not certainly the policy experts in, in, in a lot of the areas that might be kind of picked up in a wee bit more detail. I don't know okay. if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, I think that's right. It's just really for the policy experts in each respective government to take the lead on and identify the areas that they want to investigate a bit further. So. Thank you, convener. Uh, good morning. And, and what is wellbeing budgeting and how can the concept be used to protect and improve Scotland's natural environment? So, so wellbeing budgeting is really about trying to spend according to the outcomes that you want to achieve. So we need, really need to be clear about what we think our wellbeing outcomes look like, and that's actually set out in the NPF. What we learned from New Zealand, um, I won't go into too much detail because the report's actually under embargo and it's being published at the end of this month. We look forward to kind of seeing that, that being published. But basically they've taken a top slice of their budget and tried to apply test. So this is about test and learn and sharing approaches. Um, they've tried to apply a wellbeing budgeting approach to say 10% of their, their, their total budget spend. And what they've done is identify what wellbeing priorities mean for them. Um, and they've looked at the evidence and said, well, these five or six things can possibly really define what wellbeing progress means for our society. And then I guess from that, what they've done is they've taken evidence um, and looked at what impact does that have, not just on wellbeing, but on distribution, on economic growth and a whole range of dimensions. And the New Zealand approach has gone out and sought bids from um, partners and agencies um, who have put together bids for spending on what they think wellbeing budgets and spend looks like. And they've assessed them on a number of criteria. So that criteria can be set by their ministers beforehand. And it consists of things like, um, is there good evidence of the impact? Do they have good line of sight to their wellbeing um, outcomes? Is there evidence of good evaluation already put in practice? Do they recognise some of the trade-offs that this wellbeing policy might, might enact and how, how clearly do they set that out? And I think from what we heard last week, uh, they got around 500 bids from across New Zealand and they assessed and scored them based on these criteria that they set out in terms of how well they met their wellbeing priorities. So the wellbeing priorities were set out quite clearly in advance and um, I think they're going to fund according to, to which, one, which one of those bids best meets the outcomes. Okay, 
And um, and notwithstanding the fact that you're publishing a report at the end of the month, um, are you looking at any practical changes to the budgeting process that could be made to analyse or encourage allocation of budgets to maximise well-being through ways of identi identifying and targeting, for example, more pr preventative spending for, you know, spend to save? Um, so as you just say, it's New Zealand that are publishing the report at the end of the month. It's New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand, and not us. Um, not right, forgive so me. So that, that's all right. Um, but in terms of your, your last question around preventative spend and thinking about outcomes-based budgeting, that, I guess that would be best answered by DG Exchequer colleagues who are working around kind of spending review and budget decisions. We are doing a bit of analytical work, being analysts in kind of the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor, thinking about how does predictive analytics help us understand better the value of preventative spend and their projects that are in very early stage development. And there's a whole lot of issues to kind of work through as you do something around predictive analytics, just around how do you get that data that you need to understand what the risk factors of certain groups of the population or early intervention are. Um, and, and we're using the wellbeing group to try and understand more about how other countries have used techniques like that to understand better preventative spend issues. There's a particular interest to this committee, preventative spending in terms of our budget process. Um, so is there any a given the preliminary work that you've done, as I understand it, is there any obvious, as it were, low-hanging fruit where your preventative spend can um, help the, the natural environment or, or not? Nothing that's occurred to you yet, or maybe there is something that's obvious. N unfortunately, none that I'm aware of in that context at the moment. Okay, Supplementary question from Mark Ruskell on this theme. Yeah, I interested in this uh, New Zealand approach to top slicing budgets and then you know encouraging bids um, around particular themes but are there any more kind of mainstream approaches to looking at whole government budgets that are put in place by governments and I guess sort of following on from that is there um, are there are there some structural difficulties in the way that governments operate you know we, we see you know ministerial portfolios um, sometimes, you know, there are concerns around silo mentality within governments and, and executives as well. So, how do you how do you get that joined up holistic approach to to well being? I think that's that's really effectively you've set out what the challenge is in trying to do outcomes based budgeting, and it's something that we're really keen to learn from, and hope that this platform through the well being group of governments will enable us to do so. Um, I'm very conscious that budgets are based on portfolios and departmental spend, but it's about understanding how we do take that step back and looking at outcomes and spend according to that. I don't think um, I'm in a position to, to explain that very well at the moment. It's not something that I deal with um, as, as part of my job. Trying to engage with the OECD on, they've done quite a lot of work on this wellbeing agenda and have recently written a report on well-being approaches in central government. Um, so that's got some recommendations on different approaches being applied in different uh, governments. And I think that's what's interesting about the New Zealand government approach is that they give additional scoring to bids that collaborate across portfolios towards that common ambition. So I think that is the kind of crux of the well-being agenda. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. I move on to questions from Claudia Bimish. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning to you both. Uh, I'd like to uh, focus a little bit more on the national performance framework and then on the, the um, underpinning, I hope, by sustainable um, development goals, the, the UN goals. Um, it's, it's obviously very important. It's really building on the points that have been made already, and I do appreciate its early days for you, but our national performance framework does try to break down silos and... Uh, um, I happen to have been on the round table for that for a number of years, and we've seen quite a lot of progress. You highlighted uh, in your um, initial comments something about child poverty, and that's something very high on all um, governments' and parties' agendas. Is there anything more you can say about that in relation to the, um, the national performance framework and, uh, and also how that might fit with our, our um, brief? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not the policy expert on child poverty, but from what I've heard from my colleagues, what they're doing in terms of understanding the broad range of actions that need to be taken across portfolios and different areas of government to tackle child poverty, it's something I think they are looking at in terms of their overall framework and how they start aligning that much more broadly across the NPF. 
I think from our discussions, it is recognised that the solution to child poverty doesn't sit in one area. It sits right across government and beyond. And it's about understanding how we start to align all of these and give a line of sight to, to, to those NPF frameworks and, and outcomes. Mm -hmm. I think um, New Zealand are particularly interested in child poverty as well because that draws on the intergenerational element of well-being. And I think that also ties to when you start thinking about intergenerational aspects, the sustainability and the environmental discussions, but I don't think that's incorporated in our NPF, but obviously child poverty itself is in the indicators and outcomes that we have. I'm thinking the connections um, with well-being and child mental health and, and access to the fresh air and also air pollution issues, which all affect, um, well, all of us, but, but you know, the, the, the young and, and vulnerable and how, how those connections can be made uh, are those sort of issues that you'll be able to be looking at in the future in your in your policy deliberations, do you think? We certainly hope so. And, and in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals, could either of you comment on how that fits in? Obviously, this work is international and they're, they're international commitments, so it would be useful to hear from either of you or both about those goals. So, so the NPF has um, aligned itself to sustainable development goals yes. as well and through this work we'll be making sure that both are visible and upfront in the discussions around the policy labs. And I guess our collaboration on this project with other governments kind of ties into, I think it's SDG 17 that promotes fostering collaboration towards the goals. So I think specifically the well-being, so specifically this group helps us deliver on that one uh, SDG but the whole wellbeing agenda helps us ultimately deliver all of them, I would say. Mm -hmm. and, and just lastly from, from me, will there be updates, well I hope there will be, but will there be regular updates on these issues on a website that all of us can look at? Yes, absolutely. We're in the process of developing the website at the moment. We've got a placeholder website at the moment, but um, as we start to conduct more meetings and produce papers from and outputs from the sessions that we have. We hope to make them openly available to all. Because mm, you've already mentioned one um, paper that sounds very interesting that I didn't know about, which is well, the CD one, you know, yeah. for instance. So, so uh, for, for yeah. policymakers and indeed, you know, people at all levels of government and citizens to be able to yeah. look at this to see how we can take these very important issues forward would be really valuable. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mark Ruskell? Just following on from that, um, uh, has your work fed into the development of strategic environmental policy in Scotland, and in particular the environment strategy, which is under development? Um, it's potential for a, an agricultural bill as well. So, I'm just I'm interested to to know kind of which departments are sort of over your work and and you know are actively collaborating with you, or is it particular departments who've got a particular interest at this point? We reach out to all departments across Scottish Government as part of our overall kind of oversight on the economic strategy element and looking beyond and thinking about how this agenda incorporates contributions from, from everywhere. In terms of um, kind of the environmental side of it and colleagues who work on that side of the strategy, we're really keen to engage with them as we develop not just um, our metrics on inclusive growth, but really try and understand how we build the whole environmental indicators as part of our whole um, kind of outcomes framework as well. So we are engaging quite closely with them and want to ensure that we keep joined up right across mm. government. But, but not specifically on the environment strategy at this point? Not at this point. We've had some early okay. conversations with them, but right. not fed in. Well, what about the role of the Scottish National Investment Bank? I mean, it, you know, clearly a bank that's got a very joined up mission-based approach on climate and a num number of other um, missions that relate to inclusive growth. Um, is, is that something which you've been again invited in to, to provide input into? Yes, we're, we're again closely linked to them. Some of their analysts sit within the office of the Chief Economic Advisor, so we have that ability to mean close links as they develop their agenda. Right. Okay. Is there anything specifically coming out of that engagement at the moment? Just in terms of their missions and the read across to how they prioritise and choose to fund, um, it's about understanding what impact that has on overall outcomes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, Convener. With regard to well-being and growth, wh where does growth feature in the concept of a, a well-being economy which also maintains and enhances natural capital? So basically, is there uh, such a thing as green growth? 
I think this is the ultimate debate, and it's a, really about understanding and being honest about the trade-offs that we're willing to accept as a country as we pursue all of our objectives around economic growth, environmental sustainability, and social inclusion. I think, as, as far as we can, we need to be mindful about pursuing policies that are able to have a positive impact on all three, but where ultimately they don't, we need to be really honest and clear about the trade-offs and what else other actions we can do to mitigate some of those negative impacts that might arise. So I think that's something we're very mindful of as we start to think about developing our own analytical underpinning to, to this kind of work. How do we start accounting and really taking that, those trade-offs and those synergies into account in terms of our measurement framework and our impact assessments? Okay, thanks. Uh, Mark Ruskell. The central purpose of government at present is sustainable economic growth. I'm just wondering if that is, is a term or a concept which is also applied internationally, does that sit comfortably with, with inclusive growth or, or, or you know, what other countries are, are pursuing? Is, does it need to evolve? We describe inclusive growth as inclusive sustainable economic growth um, in the sense that inclusive growth has to be something that's able to deliver in the long term and has that long term transformational effect. Um, in terms of inclusive growth agenda, we're really mindful that we have to grow again within their existing parameters around financial and environmental sustainability. Uh, in, internationally, it tends to get used, I think, in, in the same way, but there's no real tight definition of sustainability um, when it comes to defining economic growth, and that's always been quite quite loose, I think, in its concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, John? No. Um, can, I mean, uh, is there anything to learn from the other devolved... Um, countries such as Wales or Northern Ireland or, or even Ireland itself become a country of comparable size to New Zealand and ourselves? No, definitely. Um, and we have engaged with officials in the Government of Wales recently and hoping to engage with them in future meetings. Another report worth mentioning is from the Carnegie Trust UK who have written a report on well-being and devolved governments which kind of highlights some of the agendas and programmes being in place in Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, which may be worth circulating as well. Um, so there's definitely a lot to learn closer to home as well as from further afield like New Zealand. Thanks. Uh, Thank you, Kavina. Could I ask a little further on, on the, that, those definitions um, that we work with in terms of the prosperity of all of, all of our country, of all of Scotland? Are, are there examples from elsewhere that you can either highlight to us now or perhaps um, let us know about as a committee which um, where there's a commitment by countries to sustainable development specifically rather than sustainable inclusive um, growth. I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, any other questions from my colleagues? We'll, we'll have time for a last question. Uh, Mark Ruskell? No. Did you um, did, you yes. believe you're covered. Um, I was going to I appreciate a little bit further, but just in terms of what we can learn from other devolved administrations, I've been pretty struck by the work of the Future Generations Commissioner, uh, not, not just the work on young people and language and environmental sustainability, but a whole range of other areas. If, if you were to sort of look at what, what we do in Scotland with the NPF and our current frameworks, and what they do in Wales with the Future Generations Commissioner, where is the, where is the gap? Is, is there added value that the FGC is bringing to Wales that we don't have yet in Scotland? What is that gap that, that, that exists? So that's something, that does that, exist? It's something we want to explore and we're really mindful that they have this um, Future Generations Commission and we're quite keen to actually learn from them in terms of how they're doing it and actually what the gaps are in Scotland in terms of our policy sufficiency in gaps. I think it just kind of touches on the intergenerational aspect that I'd mentioned before that's in New Zealand's Living Standards Framework. Um, I think that's what kind of comes out from the Future Generations Commission's work. But what about in terms of advice for public bodies? Is that, is that a function that is currently undertaken on environment policy elsewhere in, in Scotland? Or is that specific function of the S FJC replicated or, or not? Because I don't see public bodies being held to account exactly the same way. You've got SNH, you've got SEPA, but, but there isn't that, that sort of commission to really look at whether policy is being generated that, that will really uh, you know, d deliver, deliver future thinking. 
So, for example, the M4 expansion in Wales, FJC has taken quite a strong role in terms of scrutinising that. Yeah. What, is there an equivalent body yeah. in Scotland? We don't yeah. have an equivalent body in Scotland, no. as far as I'm aware of, but certainly something that's worth, worth looking into. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, we look forward to seeing what you, comes out of your work, and I'm sure we'll have you back again to, to report on what you've been up to. Okay, thank you. We're going to suspend the meeting briefly to allow the change in panel.
And welcome back. We uh, now move on to our final evidence session of the morning on infrastructure and carbon. And I'm delighted to welcome Ian Russell, the Chair for Infrastructure Commission for Scotland. Good morning to you, Mr. Russell. Good morning, um, I'm going to start off with, a, I suppose, a fairly blanket question just to get us uh, started on this topic. We understand that the Commission members were appointed only just in February. And uh, so we appreciate you coming here today so soon uh, to talk about a very early um, stages of your work. You plan to report on infrastructure ambitions and priorities by the end of 2019. Could you outline the immediate plans and priorities in your work? So, uh, good morning, Commissioner, and thank you all for inviting me to, to come and talk with you this morning. Um, we were appointed uh, in February by the Cabinet Secretary, Mr Matheson, and given two tasks, one to come up with a 30-year vision of Scotland's infrastructure by the end of December, and secondly, by June of next year, to give him advice on how to deliver that. He gave us a very clear instruction that this, this should not involve sitting in a room thinking about what the answer is, but to go and engage as widely as possible across Scotland and more, more internationally um, to get, gather evidence on both the vision and, and the delivery. So our, our priority um, has been to set out as broad as possible an invitation to people and organisations to contribute evidence. Um, we set out that invitation at the end of February. Um, at the end of last week, we'd had about 120 uh, submissions from across Scotland and more widely. And so the Commission's priority at the moment is going through that evidence and drawing out the key aspects of it to allow us to, to create more focus in the coming months uh, on the Commission's work. So e evidence gathering is, is the phase that we're, we're now in. Thank you very much for that. John Scott. Thank you and good morning. Um, can I ask you about the expertise and what expertise um, does the Commission have on its board or through other channels on environmental issues? For example, assessing low carbon infrastructure, biodiversity impacts, marine planning, etc. The, um, the, the Commission is, is broadly spread, um, both public and private sector. Um, we have a range of specific skills, in, including environmental and low carbon, on the, on the Commission. But I think also, and importantly, um, in answer to the first question, this is really about gathering evidence from other people. So we wrote to 5,500 organisations and individuals asking for evidence. We're going to hold uh, five or six regional forums across Scotland, which will give uh, people with expertise, including um, environmental and low carbon expertise, an opportunity to come and talk to us. Um, we're going to use social media to reach a younger group um, and get their views on Scotland's infrastructure. And in the autumn, uh, and this perhaps goes particularly, Mr Scott, to your question, we expect to hold a number of expert sessions where we really, as a commission, drill down into particular topics, and I would expect the areas that you've mentioned to be a major part of that. Yes, with a particular emphasis on low carbon infrastructure? I, I think low carbon, but more generally sustainability. The overall, um, uh, overall objective that the Cabinet Secretary has given us for the, the advice that he's asked for on the 30-year vision um, is, is sustainable, inclusive economic growth. And I was sitting at the back listening to the previous uh, end of the discussion about exactly that subject. So essentially blue sky thinking, what a fascinating opportunity for you and others. <laughs> I, think, I, think it's a, I think it's a gap in our armoury at the moment. Um, the Scottish Government's definition of infrastructure, as you're probably aware, covers 13 or 14 different areas, you know, everything from 
transport, energy, water, all the way through to health, education, housing. So it's a pretty broad canvas. Each of those individual areas have their own plans. What's perhaps not evident quite so much at the moment is the, are, the, are the linkages between those plans. And I think that's the focus for the Commission's work during this year. Many thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark Ruskell. Infrastructure. Um, are we looking at natural capital as well? So I'm thinking of, uh, you know, an ecological network, for example, uh, Central Scotland Green Network um, sits within the national planning framework as a, as a major piece of infrastructure. It's reflected within the planning system as well. Do, what, what are the opportunities to look at the natural environment, natural capital, particularly in relation to you know, what we need to do to tackle the, the biodiversity challenge and the climate challenge as major national infrastructure projects? So, for example, a national ecological network is something that, that's been discussed in this committee and, and in the chamber on numerous occasions as a, as a major piece of our carbon sequestration, biodiversity enhancing infrastructure. Is that something that, that is within your remit and is within Mr. Matheson's interest, or are we talking primarily about bridges and stuff? I, th I think it's broader than bridges and stuff, to, to play that back to you. Um, but it does involve um, long-term investment. I think that's the, the theme here. The starting point, I believe, for the Cabinet Secretary's request for the Commission is, is advice on how the public sector and the private sector, both nationally and locally, should focus its investment over the next 30 years in order to better achieve sustainable, inclusive economic growth. I'm sure that will embrace the areas that you've, you've reflected on. I, I made a note of that as you were speaking specifically. Um, is it mentioned in the remit that we've been given word for word? No, but I, I do think it's implied in it, and it's certainly something that, that the Commission would want to take evidence on and if you were able to uh, point people in our direction on that, we'd be, we'd be very happy to engage with them. So in, in terms of the engagement that, that you're doing, I mean, you said, you know, you've written out to 5,500 organisations. Will there be a sp specific expert thematic grouping around natural capital and, and environment? You know, will there be a group looking at, you know, Scotland's rainforests, the peat bogs, and their carbon sequestration potential? I mean, is that a national, a national asset, a national part of our infrastructure? So, so the, the Commission has three people working for it. I, I'm the fourth. So we're, we're a small but perfectly formed group. Therefore, we don't have the, um, the, the volume of people to devote to specific areas. What we're trying to focus on is um, specific groups of organisations who can provide us with evidence to cover a wide range of topics, including the one that you're asking us about. So, hence my point to you, um, if you're able to, to direct us towards or point people in our direction for your interest or, or any of the other members of the, of the committee's interest, we'd be very keen to engage. We don't have all the expertise and we certainly don't have the answers, but we're very keen to gather evidence that will help us advise the Cabinet Secretary. I'm to hear that you're going to be going out to different regions as well because there's, there's going to be a lot of different solutions based on geography. Um, is that a key part of your work, to not, not centralise, but to be out in all, all areas as but much as possible and getting that local feedback? It, it, it absolutely is, and that's, that was both encouraged by the Cabinet Secretary uh, and is something the Commission has set its sights on doing in, in any event. So I, th I think we will probably end up with six regional forums. Um, I, I myself um, have had an invitation to go to the Outer Hebrides to hear what they're doing. I've accepted that invitation with great pleasure. 
and anticipate doing the same for Orkney and Shetland. So it's, it's islands as well as mainland Scotland. Okay, thank you. Claudia Bimish. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning uh, to you, Mr. Russell. Uh, building on Mark Ruskell's question, could, could I ask whether I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary has given a remit in relation to infrastructure um, definitions, if one would call them that. Is there any room for manoeuvre in relation to, for instance, adding on something such as green infrastructure in view of how important um, that is to the well-being and future of Scotland? I, I think there is. Uh, every opportunity to add to the to the remit um, realistically to to perform a useful function in what is now seven or eight months we've got to be pretty focused in in what we look at and what we advise on but um, I'm clear and I think my interpretation of the cabinet secretary's desire is is clear um, that low carbon environment sustainable green assets are absolutely within the remit of, of the Commission. Um, what he defined for us was a fairly high level remit building on the Scottish Government's existing definition of infrastructure and I think he's left us to interpret at, at the next level of detail what we, what we go into. So the sort of discussion we're having now is immensely helpful to that. I was particularly concerned uh, in view of, you'll be aware, as, as everybody on the committee is aware of the um, UN report on, on um, nature, which came out yesterday, yes. the, the high-level yes. report. And so in view of that, I would, I would very much hope, uh, not least in view of that, but that mm. green infrastructure could be one of the high-level definitions. But perhaps that's for the committee to consider as well. Okay, thank you. We move on to questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, I, I want to uh, focus on uh, a bit more on low carbon and perhaps low emissions. But before doing so, I wonder if uh, you could perhaps tell me how um, this relates to the UK government's critical national infrastructure. There's 13 headings in that, uh, two of which appear to touch on the interests of this committee, uh, probably uh, energy, uh, food, um, and water, perhaps, uh, might, might be there. How does this relate to it? Now, it's worth saying my take on the critical national infrastructure, and I used to have to work within that framework my professional life, um, is about maintaining the status quo ante. Is it fair to say you are actually about creating the new rather than protecting the old? But how does it relate to that existing national infrastructure legislation and practice? So I, I think we are about stepping out 30 years ahead and looking back to today, the Cabinet Secretary has asked us to advise on how plans for the next five years provide a platform for that 30-year vision. So we're being asked to join up the future to the present in infrastructure terms. Um, of the categories that you've mentioned, energy and water are definitely within our remit. Food uh, is not, I think, um, but I may be missing a subtlety there. And if I am uh, on behalf of the Commission, we would certainly like to take that on board. Well, my, my immediate reaction is that food might be something you would consider. It would certainly, I suspect, be of interest to us and this committee more generally, if it's not within you remit as well. Anyway, your 30-year horizon takes you to 2049. Um, and now, with the government adopting what the UK Climate Change Committee has set as uh, climate change targets, in other words, uh, zero um, greenhouse gas emissions by 2045, that's within your period. Um, so, just to throw you the curveball that is a few days old. Um, has the adoption of that target uh, uh, changed your thinking on how you will deal with not simply low carbon, but low emissions? And indeed, perhaps in carbon, in particular, negative carbon emissions, mm -hmm. so that we can offset those areas uh, of our, our life where it will be import, such as agriculture, where it will be virtually impossible to get to zero. And we need to make sure yep. other parts of the equation work. I, I don't think, in answer to your 
question. I don't think it's changed our thinking. I think it may shape the areas in which we gather further evidence over the next two to three months. Um, I, I just want to repeat what I said earlier, that what we're being asked to do is not think ourselves of what the answer is, but to gather evidence from as broad a church as we can as to what other people think the answer is. So um, as reports and advice, both within the UK and internationally, come out during this year, we'll certainly be building that into our thinking in the way in which we gather evidence and, and then transform that into advice to, to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, since we started in February, uh, the last couple of months have been very much about uh, making people aware of the existence of the Commission and our remit and asking for initial evidence. Um, as I've mentioned, that, that call for initiative evidence closed on, on Friday. We've been very pleased with the diversity of the response that we've, we've had. Um, we're now beginning to go through that evidence. So you, your question is very pertinent, and I'm sure there will be further reports and advice from uh, all governments uh, and all parts of governments which will influence our thinking and our evidence gathering, you know, particularly over the summer. We, we need to start drawing conclusions by September, October time if we're going to report to the Cabinet Secretary in, in December. But, but certainly over the summer, there's an opportunity for us to cast the net more widely. Um, and finally, um, you said uh, you, were, you were looking at a five-year horizon as well as the 30-year horizon. Now, will you do the 30-year horizon first yes. so that you can then infer what needs to be done in five years? Yeah rather than looking backwards and projecting forwards to five years. Now, I say that in the context because my, my last professional responsibility 20 years ago was precisely doing this sort of thing, only I was working to a 25-year horizon, and we found it immensely useful to try and posit 25 years out to help us understand what we need to do in the first five years. I, I can give you categorical assurance. It's my, it's, it may be the only answer today I give you categorical assurance on that we are starting with 30 years and working back. Thank you. Ben Carson. I'd like to look at what the Commission uh, position was and the potential for infrastructure. What, what do you see as the potential for infrastructure to lock in behavioural change uh, and, and also uh, look at greenhouse gas emission reduction? Part of our, our remit is to think about the delivery of public services and the interaction of public services with the, with the, with individuals, um, both in the public and the and the private sector. So uh, the thinking of the commission is not about an item of infrastructure per se, but what that leads to, whether that's service delivery or behaviour or other impacts. So uh, the behavioural changes that are being considered are those within our remit that would lead to the objectives that we've been given, such as sustainable, inclusive economic growth, low carbon, uh, a, a more diverse society, etc. So we're, we've been given almost like outcomes, if you like, and asked to think about what the infrastructure is needed to deliver the behaviour that would produce those those outcomes. So a, on a practical basis, at the moment we're, we're waiting with bated be breath to hear what this South of Scotland transport uh, tr tr strategic review will, will uh, come out with. Uh, my constituency has one of the busiest trunk roads in the UK and the third busiest port with, with a, a high number of freight uh, lorries or HGVs. Um, there's <coughs> campaigns for a reopening railway lines and whatever. When that review comes forward, is it likely to be referred to you? Or do you take that review and look at the evidence and, and make recommendations on the back of that report that the government will, will publish any time soon? So our, our remit, um, I think, involves us receiving reports such as that, consultation documents such as that, 
um, but really joining them up to other areas of infrastructure. So if you think of a dozen or so pillars of infrastructure of which transport may well be one, I don't think the Commission has the time or the expertise to second guess one of the long-term plans for a particular pillar of infrastructure. But what we are about is saying, well, if, if that's the plan for transport, how does that connect to the plan for energy or housing or healthcare? And what are, what are the interconnections and the interactions between them to deliver the behaviours and the outcomes that you were referring to in the, in the earlier question? Okay. Um, my final question is on the back of, of uh, Stuart Stevenson's question. G given the, 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 the recent update of the climate change uh, recommendations, what's your views on the scale of the challenge and the need for uh, real-time action, so that the urgency to, to, to put new policies in place, how will that affect your work? So I think, I think it's back to the, are we starting with the 30 years or the five years? We're, we're starting with the 30 years. So if we start that far out um, and look back, that should inform the priorities that we have over the next five years, five to 10 years, et cetera. Um, in infrastructure terms, for the next five years, a lot of the projects that will be delivered over the next five years have already started in planning, if not actually on, on the ground. So in reality, working back from a 30-year view, we're probably going to have more influence on the projects that start in a five to 10-year time period than a one to five-year time period. But we've, we've been asked to comment on, on one to five. Mark Busco, do you have a follow-up question for me? How would, how would you see your, your work uh, dovetailing with the Strategic Transport Projects Review then? How does, how, what, what would you see as your role within that process? And, and at what point? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Had you finished? Um, I, I, I think our role um, is to take that consultation document and draw inferences from it for infrastructure more widely. I, I, I don't see the Commission's role, <clears throat> and I, I don't think the Cabinet Secretary sees the Commission's role as being one of commenting on or interrogating or trying to sort of second guess a review of a particular pillar of infrastructure, in this case transport. I think what we're about is taking that, uh, having a review of it, and thinking about the interactions between it and other long-term plans for electricity or water or housing or, or health care. Um, so we, we have already had discussions with Transport Scotland and will continue to, to do that, but more in, in an engaged way where we understand what their plan is so that we can interpret its consequences elsewhere on, on infrastructure. Does that does, make sense? Yeah, it, it, it does. I think it's, it's a picture that we're, that we're trying to, to understand a bit more clearly. But how does that then overlap with the roles and responsibilities of, of councils, for example? I, I, I think um, the advice that we're giving to, to the Cabinet Secretary um, will have to be uh, looked at and interpreted by um, public and private sector Scotland as a whole. Um, I'm sure the Scottish Government will want to, having, having taken our advice, think about how it wants to go about achieving those areas of our advice that it, it takes on board. Um, and you know, the Commission is very aware that a lot of infrastructure in Scotland is maintained and delivered by organisations that are not the Scottish Government. So in a sense, this is providing an umbrella report, but there's a lot of delivery and investment organisations that are not actually the, the, the Scottish Government itself. And, and, and local councils, local organisations would, would be part of that. Okay. Um, can, can I go to Angus first and yes, come back gonna, to you? Yes, yeah. yes, of course. Yeah. 
Angus. Okay, thanks, um, Camilla. With regard uh, further to the infrastructure plan and um, advice, which has already been touched on by, by colleagues, can, can I ask specifically uh, how you plan to make your advice on any long-term infrastructure plan coherent uh, with the statutory climate targets, uh, and which, as we know, um, the, the 2045 emission reduction target for Scotland and, and 2050 for the UK. How do you intend to ensure that uh, th it is coherent? So I, I, I think going back to our, our remit um, and the provision of advice for this longer term vision, that's not going to involve us um, in looking at or recommending specific projects. It's going to be more themes and interconnections between different pillars of infrastructure, consequences. If you, if you build this, you're going to have to think about that. So the statutory um, constraints or objectives across all infrastructure, and, and not just the one that you've mentioned, but there are other statutory uh, points that we need to take in, into account will have to be reflected in, in our advice, but they'll, they'll appear um, not as project level uh, advice, they'll appear as more strategic level advice, because I think that's the nature of the, of the report that we're being asked to, to produce. We, we have neither the time nor the expertise to go into individual project levels. Okay, thanks. Mark, back to you. So how should we understand and score the climate impact of competing infrastructure projects? Well, that's a good question. Perhaps it's, it's one for your committee to have a better answer for than me at this point. And I'd, I'd welcome coming back and hearing your thoughts on it. But I think from our point of view, we've been given a broad goal, sustainable, low carbon, inclusive economic growth. There's, there's, there's no figures in that. The, uh, there was an earlier question about um, uh, neg negative carbon e emissions and that begins to get you into that, that subject, I think. For, from our point of view, we're not, um, we're not gonna re recommend in our advice to the Cabinet Secretary, specific projects. So we're not going to get into a trade-off at project level. What we may get into is a trade-off at types of infrastructure level. And, and I think that's one of the interesting themes that we'll, we'll need to draw out. I mean, your, your committee is asking extremely good questions. We have just embarked on evidence gathering. So this is very helpful to me in shaping the way we go about and drawing evidence and how we think about the evidence that we get. Um, but we, you know, we're, we're not going to have all the answers until, until the end of the year when we deliver our report. Mm -hmm. So would it be your intention then to provide your advice to different committees within the parliament based on particular themes or I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure how you would at this stage I know it's very early days but how you would wish to interact with with committees are obviously looking at budget decisions and the NPF and so I, I, I think our, our remit is to report to the cabinet secretary and when we've done that uh, we'd be very happy to come and discuss our findings with yourselves and I, I have already said to other committees we'd be happy to meet with with them um, either, either individually or, or in a committee session, formally or informally. But I, I, I think, in fairness, our first report goes to the to the cabinet secretary. Thank you, Finn Carson. I suppose this is a daft laddie question and to get right down to practicalities. And I'll give you an example again. It comes from my constituency, but, but it would be equally relative to, to any other constituency in the same situation. So we have a port, and if the government decided that that the sustainability, the long-term future of that port was really important. But there were um, two ways to do that, and that was either to upgrade the roads leading to that port or uh, to 
reinstate a railway line or build a new railway line, mm -hmm. and one was substantially more expensive than the other, would it be your job to advise the government that potentially, when it comes to carbon or long-term sustainability, the railway line might be the best solution, even though it costs initially four or five times more? And, and your argument would be looking at the, the, the uh, greenhouse gas potential uh, reductions from a railway line, electrified railway line or whatever. Is that what you will do in, in practice? So we've, we've been um, in, a, in our remit, we've, we've not been given any fiscal constraints, but we've been asked to take account of what is inevitably a constrained budget over a 30 year period. So we're not, we're not being asked to make financial trade-offs as such but we're being asked to take account of the financial position. And so I, I expect that you're right. I think there would be within our report um, alternatives. I, 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 it seems to me highly unlikely, uh, even at this early stage, that we will come up with one right answer. I think there's more likely to be some scenarios f from which to, to, to select options. Um, probably not at a project level as detailed as the example that you've given, but, but more thematically, I think there may, there may well be some scenarios that we offer to the Cabinet Secretary as different ways of achieving the, the end objectives that he's, he's seeking to, to take advice on. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Uh, really following on from that, and then I have a, 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 another question. Uh, for you, Mr. Russell. Could, could I ask whether there's um, a process that you're able to identify whereby you can look at the lock-in of um, the concerns about lock-in for new high carbon projects? Or, and I'm not going to recommend one, but I'm wondering if you're, you're using one or whether that um, is, is in your thoughts. Um, it, it's, it's not something we've turned our thoughts to yet, but I'm sure we will over the summer as we start to think about the evidence that we're, we're gathering. Right, thank you. And, and while I appreciate the point you make that you're reporting to the Cabinet Secretary, um, do you have measures um, or will you be developing measures whereby you can um, assess the um, success of the low carbon remit that you obviously have as part of your remit? I, th I think in our report, um, we... we we almost have to find some way of recommending the not, not only the methodology for delivering the vision, which the Cabinet Secretary has asked us to report on from January to June of next year, that's the second part of our brief, but, but beyond that, how the vision and the delivery is refreshed periodically and, and the outcomes measured. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that the, that the Commission will hope to have achieved by the end of its life is a degree of uh, cross-party support for a, a long-term vision. We can all discuss individual projects and aspects of it, but you'd sort of like to think that we could try and help um, the Scottish Government get uh, support, um, broad support, for a long-term a long -term vision um, and, and the refreshing of it and the measuring of the, of the progress towards it, including in the area that you've specifically mentioned. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I don't think we've got any more questions. Oh, no, sorry, John, you, you wanted to ask a question. Thank you. And just briefly, but, um, so if I've understood you correctly, Mr. Russell, um, Will you be, when you say developing themes, so would that be at the level of, for example, from your own background of energy, um, would that be um, different types of, of energy provision, renewables, um, or tidal, or wave, or, or hydrogen, or are you being invited to kind of look into that future orb? to see which one you suggest to the government that they might back at that level of approach? I, I think we're not being invited to be that specific. It may well be in the evidence that we gather that we see 
pros and cons that lead us to advice that would suggest to the Cabinet Secretary, you know, these two or three paths might be better than those two or three paths. So the, the, the remit has not been to be that specific, but in the evidence we see, that might give us a, a basis, a sound basis, for advising the Cabinet Secretary generally, but maybe not quite as specifically, uh, in, in the areas that you've referred to. And will your evidence gathering presumably encompass universities as well as individual businesses, presumably? It will, and in the 120 or so um, uh, pieces of evidence that we've already received, uh, universities are represented within that, as are colleges. Much. Great, thank you very much and I think I probably speak for everyone that would like to accept your invitation to come back and thank speak you. to us again after you've reported to the Cabinet Secretary because I think your work is going to be very interesting and uh, really it's going to inform quite a lot of our scrutiny as well so thank you very much for your time this morning Thank you very much, thank you all uh, I'm going to suspend this session No, I'm not, I'm not. That concludes uh, the committee's business in public today. At its next meeting on the 14th of May, the committee will be taking evidence ahead of consideration of amendments to the climate change bill at stage two. And the committee will hear from the committee on climate change in relation to their updated device, uh, advice to the Scottish Government. And the committee will also be considering a response to the recent correspondence from the Finance and Constitution Committee on EU Frameworks and will consider its annual report for 2018 and 19. And as agreed uh, previously, we'll now move into private session and ask the public gallery to be cleared as the public part of this meeting is now closed and we'll have a suspension. <laughs>